Good evening and welcome to tonight's talk. Tonight's talk is on communication and effective communication in relationships in the workplace. The communication, communication skills are positive in general, uh, in any situation. And so it is said that bad communication ends a lot of good things and good communication ends a lot of bad things. Um, there's a Simpsons episode where Homer goes to alcohol, the solution to and the cause of most of world's problems, the world's problems. And my, well, for those of you who don't know me, David Lee is my name. I'm the founder and chief coach of Leeway Mind and Body Mastery, which essentially means I work with the mind and the body. You would have heard it's you need a healthy mind to have a healthy body. Uh, a healthy body is a healthy mind, but you do need a healthy mind to make the decision in order to have a healthy body. And a healthy mind helps you make a lot of decisions in life, a lot of uh, success in life, I believe, comes down to the decisions and the choices you make. The difference between happiness and unhappiness is choice. But in order to be happy or to uh, experience happiness, you need to make a choice. Uh, Australia Day, I was sitting in this wonderful uh, uh, skiff club, manly skiff club it was, and this young boy was being a bit glum and, you know, complaining about whatever it was and, and knowing him to, you know, believe in God and heaven and talk about it quite often in a really uh, innocent and, and optimistic and positive way. I said to him, um, do you believe that you'll be happy in heaven? And he said, I do. And I said, why is that? And he said, because it's heaven. And I said, John Milton, he wouldn't have known who John Milton is and, you know, I barely know him myself. John Milton said, some people can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. And my point to the young boy, I said, well, hang on, right now this is heaven to me. Where we are sitting is heaven to me and I'm happy. But I can't understand why you're unhappy. And he said, because I choose to be. And we both had a bit of a laugh and he went on to be, to be happy. And it, it, dwelled, it, it sat with me for a while in that a lot of the time how we, we sit uh, with ourselves and our situations determines, you know, where those situations will go. Um, grudges, for example, are, are basically deciding to not be friendly or not forgive that person. They say forgiveness is accepting the apology you're never going to get. And there's another quote which says forgiveness is setting the prisoner free and recognising the prisoner was yourself. Now, forgiveness requires effective communication. So halfway through the intro, I, I, I got distracted, as I always do. Uh, my first ever job, I was a mailboy. And Doug Mulray was the radio announcer of the time, so it was the late 80s. And he, I remember him saying one day that communication is the cause and the solution. I, I got distracted with the Homer Simpson quote, to most of the world's problems. Now, whether it's effective communication or non-effective communication. And so... Um, the idea of wars being fought because this country didn't believe or agree with that country's opinion. And the opinion in a lot of cases is belief-based and in most cases around religions. Uh, quite often the communication problems we face in the workforce and the workplace are based around the fact that we have a butting of heads or a misunderstanding or a disagreement uh, with people. There's an expression, uh, to know you is to love you. And I've noticed that the more you get to know some people, the more you get to like them and vice versa. You can get to know someone who you might have thought, wow, what a smoking hot person that character is or that person is. And then you notice they're very mean and nasty and they treat people rude to cab drivers and mean to waitresses or waiters. And you start to question their inner beauty. Um, so I think from a communications perspective, my Mail boy job, obviously, I went into to sales and then I became a, a leader in sales forces and I found the most rewarding of all of my sales teams was coaching, counselling, leading and motivating sales teams. So I studied coaching and positive psychology and I went into executive coaching and for probably the last, I, I started working with Australian Men's Fitness, I became the in-house personal trainer when I studied personal training and so I've been a mind and body coach since about 2011, prior to that just executive coaching. The reason I raise all this is that as a coach working with businesses, I did a lot of presentation skills training and effective communication skills training, even to the point where 
keynote speaking or writing a, a speech that you wanted to give to somebody. Now, working with some of my clients recently where they've said, I'm really, really, I get really afraid when I have to give a talk. And with some of them, I think, wow, I, I know you as a really confident, vibrant and intelligent person. Why is it that you get nervous when you get in front of a crowd? Do you know your stuff? And this lady said to me the other day, well, I do. And I said, do you, do you know your stuff? Now, this lady is talking about, she's a doctor. She's talking about ultrasounds and echograms and all this stuff that I, I guess most of us wouldn't know about. And I said, would you call yourself a subject matter expert in that field? And she said, yes. And I said to her, well, why do you think the, <coughs> excuse me, the audience is going to doubt you, judge you, or, or, or whatever. And she said, I just wonder what they think about how I look and how I sound. And what popped into my head at the time, I said, well, you've heard of, you know, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking sat in a wheelchair, and I think a, a computer spoke for him, and yet nobody ever mocked, laughed, or whether he even cared, because some of the stuff he speaks of, his brilliance, and spoke of, rather, is absolute genius, subject matter expert on a lot of things. So my point of that is, if you know what you're talking about and you know your, your subject matter, then in the workplace, when you're called upon to do a presentation, it shouldn't matter. Focus on the job that you have to do, which is to serve your audience. Before I get up and, and talk in any of these situations, I think, what problem do I solve? How can I help you tonight by imparting some of the information or knowledge that I may know to make your lives and the problems you might be facing a little easier or Better. They, Jim Rohn says, it doesn't get easier, you just get stronger. And life, uh, Joshua J. Marine said, it's the challenges of life that make life interesting. It's overcoming those challenges that make life meaningful. Now, a lot of us faced with the challenges of communication, <coughs> excuse me, whether in the workforce or at home, whether that's with your partner or with your children, that's what I'd like to address tonight. Roy T. Bennett said, a smart person knows what to say, a wise person knows when to say it. And there really is a moment when people say, pick your moments. And quite often we go to say something and if we thought a little bit about it, then we wouldn't say it. I was talking to a friend just tonight and I said, mate, quite often I play a bit of a game with myself where I might take a photo of something that somebody's done and I think you're right, I'm gonna send them that and say, listen, what kind of a, <clears throat> I did this favor for you and did that and look how you left my place, but I don't do it. And I don't do it because I think of what would be the consequences of having done what I was going to do, whether it was send the text, whether it was, you know, write the email, whether it's have the conversation in that time and place. There is a time and a place for everything. And where you choose that time and place is based around how effectively that communication will be. Now, first and foremost, we've talked about, and you guys would be familiar with, the five love languages. Now, those languages involve, as you know, acts of service, gift giving, words of affirmation, quality time, and physical touch. Now, all of those five gifts, I always say, assume she's all five, but they have to be timely. You have, there's a time and a place. Physical touch in public could upset your partner. Um, gift giving in front of other people that makes other people feel awkward could not be the right time. Quality time that you think is quality time may not be quality time for your partner. <clears throat> Quite often, I work with men who talk about being rejected by their wives. And so they, they develop porn addictions and things like that because porn can't knock you back. Porn can't reject you. <clears throat> now, one of the things I say there is, well, how did you make your wife or partner feel? You know, she's just been mothering your children all day long and then you come home and you're needy. You, you come across as needy and then you expect her to be a, 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 an emotionally involved woman who is actually mothering another child. Whereas most women will tell you, or tell me anyway, when their partner comes to them in a confident way, and there's the man she fell in love with. That's who she's prepared to drop her guard and even, in fact, communicate. Now, communication is not just verbal. 65% of communication is body language. And again, it's reading the room. If your partner's like this, she's not buying into it. You know, as I say, it's never the towel on the bed. It's all the other things that are behind that. So for mine, I've got a, a bit of a communication mnemonic. As you all know, I work in mnemonics, or if you don't know me, 
I work in mnemonics and it's something that works from a business sense and a personal sense. And the idea is um, it, it's based around the word communication. And if you look at the C in communication is confidence. Like I said, if you're doing a presentation to a boardroom, your confidence comes from knowing you've done your homework. And if you've studied your subject matter and you've prepared the talk and you run it through your head a few times, then confidently you should give that. If somebody said, hey, can you get up and talk to everybody about whatever, you might be a little bit nervous because you'll start to think that you don't know what you're talking about. So that's going to um, go against you. But in a relationship, uh, from a communications perspective, you've got to have confidence in how and where you are having that conversation. Now, with that, confidently know that you want to have the conversation around a positive outcome for both of you. And so, as I say, bad communication can end good things and good communication can end bad things. Sometimes we think that we've communicated effectively, but we actually haven't been understood. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, seven habits of Highly Effective People has as one of them, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And so when you communicate um, with openness and even a little bit of vulnerability, you have to be checking in as to whether or not you're being understood or whether you're actually even showing understanding or empathy to your partner. You know, when you say to your partner, say, how was your day? That's kind of, it's a good question. It's an open question. If you say, hey, did you have a good day? And they say, yes or no, it's a closed question. Conversation's over. When you ask your question, how did your day, how did your day go today? Good. It's again, it's a closed question. Even though you've asked her an open question, as in it's not yes or no, it's closed in the regard that she could say good. Well, she can say fine, and everyone knows what fine means. Fine means far from it. So when you're asking your partner um, with confidence and openness how things are going, look for the meaning in what she's saying. So what does she mean by that? I often, when I talk to people, considering, as I say, I started as a coach in the executive realm, and then I became a personal trainer because I realized most people's uh, mental blocks were physical. Uh, I was talking to a, a client the other day or a new client the other day, and he said, I know you're going to get me to run, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. What I will get you to do as soon as you get out of bed is do 50 air squats and 50 push-ups. He said, you know, like, I don't think I can do 50 push-ups. And I said, it doesn't matter. Do them until you can. So if it takes you 10 minutes to do 50 push-ups, even if you have to do your knees, use your knees, do them. The point of it is, after you've done 50 air squats and 50 push-ups, you are on fire. Your physiology has been set up. Your metabolism has been kicked into gear. You start to feel good about yourself. You've released dopamine in a good hit. Your endorphin rush and serotonin. I'd love to talk to you blokes about the five major hormones and how they're all uh, connected in being aware of how we actually use them against ourselves. But the greatest thing about exercise first thing in the morning is it burns stress chemicals. The things that the short fuse that we have as we go through the day because of stress stress being determined by the degree to which you feel in control or out of control of your life, the idea that you've done some exercise, you're in control. The fact you've burnt some stress chemicals, they're not there to fire you up or to have you being reactive. So, of course, I'm going to ask people to do that. Um, but that's to put you in a good frame of mind, to put you in control and to give you a level of confidence. Um, the second M in my communication mnemonic is memory. So, if you're talking to your partner or even somebody at work and they say something that is, and, and the question that you should ask is like, is that important to you? Or what is important to you here? Or what are you trying to, what would you like me to do? Now, don't say it again. I've just said 65% of communication is body language. And some of us can use that body language to our own detriment. Like, oh, what do you want? It's histrionics. It's histrionics is overacting. It's like, oh, you know. And then no one's listening. The body language is just giving you away because you've, again, she may be guarded, but you, you know, look, oh, yeah, oh, 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 you know, clenching your jaws or whatever. You're showing something that is just, it's weak communication. You know, it's not, you're trying to let your body language do the task. In a lot of cases, men can be imposing and they're trying to, you know, and people are shutting down just because you're the only person talking. I love this because I can be the only person talking at this stage. But if you're the only person talking in the conversation, 
just because the other person's letting you talk doesn't mean they're listening or that they think you're right. In fact, in a lot of cases, they may have given up on the bother of communicating with you. Um, there are two things that I think, apart from well, body language, when you start raising your eyes when somebody says something, that's a really terrible body language to be uh, exhibiting because you've, you've kind of given up. The other thing to watch for is when the laughter goes. So if the laughter goes, I remember saying to a woman once, you know, you just don't laugh as much as you used to. And she said, well, you're not as funny as you used to be, which made me laugh. Um, but the idea of that is what I thought was funny, like knock, knock, who's there, dad, Joe, rah, rah, pull my finger, wasn't necessarily funny. And, you know, do you get it? Do you get it? Everyone got it. It just wasn't funny. So that to me was, oh, I better take a step back and think that, you know, what I think is funny and dad jokes are kind of funny in the right place and time. Dad jokes work with kids. They don't work with partners, as you may or may not know. Um, my, my, so when I say remember, when you ask somebody a question of what is really, what is really the point here? What is really the problem? How can I really be the man you want me to be? Then listen to what they say and remember it. And don't just go, okay, cool, we'll get around to that. Do it immediately. You know, if your partner says, we haven't been for dinner for ages, don't do it in front of her because she's, no, 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 that's now you've done it because I've told you. For you to remember, I mean, the idea that men forget anniversaries just boggles me. Now, I have a memory. You may know I can quote quotes and things like that, and I have a memory. But again, my mother, my, my mother, my father used to say a lot when I was a younger bloke, it's not that you forgot, it's that you thought so little of it, you didn't think it was worthwhile remembering. He used to always say, do the simple things well and everything else will take care of itself. They're the two things that I remember my father saying often and repeatedly and all that sort of thing. And so the idea that he would say, it's not that you forgot, it's that you thought so little of it, you didn't think it was worthwhile remembering. When you don't remember things that your partner has asked you to do or asked of you or you've communicated effectively, it shows her that you think so little of it, that you didn't think it was worthwhile remembering. Now, they're Matt Lee's words. And they may not be hers, but in some way, shape or form, she will let you know that she's not happy that you didn't remember. So memory is a very, very important part of communication. Uh, I'm told this is uh, features in The Lord of the Flies. I've never seen The Lord of the Flies or read the book for that matter. It wasn't part of my school curriculum. But in, um, in Native American Indian, they have what is called the Indian listening stick and it's good. It's, I always used to use it in boardroom when I was working with teams on how to get effective communications. And we would develop a what we'd call the Indian listening stick, and it could be anything. And back in the day, I had a nice Indian listening stick, and it had leeway engraved on it so that I'd be remembered and called back to do more work. But if you were talking and you had the Indian listening stick in your hand, nobody else could talk while you had the Indian listening stick. <clears throat> Excuse me. If somebody said, hey, David, I'd like to talk. I would say, oh, I'd like to add to that. And I would say, yes, what is it? And they would have to repeat back to me what they had heard me say with the understanding of what I meant by what I had said. If they said, so what you're saying is we need more blue chairs in the boardroom. I'd say, no, I actually said we need more green chairs because they go with the green wall panel. I never said anything like this. However, for the purpose of this right now, and they say, oh, yes, you need a green. I'd say, okay, yes, now you understand me? Yes, you now have the listening stick. What they were saying is I think the green on the, on the wallpaper is going to clash. When people come in, blue is a really emotional colour. Great, I understand. Can I? I understand that you think that from an emotional perspective. What would that give us? Well, David, um, I understand you said what would that give Yes, and this gets, it, it's funny at first that someone drops the conch. But it's funny at first, but eventually it becomes a really effective communication tool. And if you're struggling with this uh, in any relationship with your children, with your colleagues at work, it's a very effective way to start to do and speak in the way that you speak, uh, that you're understood. Now, I work with neuro-linguistic programming. People get afraid of NLP, as it's known. Tony Robbins calls it neuro, neuro associative conditioning. NLP basically means neuro thinking, linguistic language, P programming actions. 
How we think and how we speak is how we act. You may have heard of the Lao Tzu quote, which says, be careful of your thoughts, your thoughts become your words. Be careful of your words, your words become your actions. Be careful of your actions, your actions become your character. Be careful of your character, your character becomes your destiny. Now, that's a very nice thing for him to say, but he's essentially talking about neuro-linguistic programming. Now, people say, oh, it's manipulative and all that sort of business. It can be, and anyone can be manipulate a situation. The, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is not about ripping people off, or but anyone can use anything that's positive for negative. Anyone can use good for bad. You know, Americans will say, you know, um, guns don't kill people, people kill people, and that could be quite true. But the idea of using NLP to manipulate or whatever, that's, that's just a bad person. They're always going to do that. Um, my, my thinking on the, the um, I thought of another quote then, but I've got to, I want to talk about that later on. The idea of NLP came to me from uh, the quote Memento More by Marcus Aurelius. Now, Marcus Aurelius wrote his journaling, and I understand you guys journal, and if you don't, uh, it is the greatest way to unravel all the thoughts in your head, and particularly in line with communication. I honestly believe it's my morning journaling and my evening journaling, but more so my morning journaling that gets all the things out of my mind or brain or head onto paper that I'm then able to articulate what I bitched and moaned to myself about in a more uh, clear, concise and controlled manner than what I would if I just flew off the handle and said, well, you know what? Oh! And the idea of saying that smart people know what to say, wise people know when to say it, I was going to say something to my partner the other day and I thought, no, I thought of that quote. And so I was wise in not saying it. At two o'clock in the morning, having not slept and the conversation came up again, what I did say was, was smart. It was, it was never going to be the wise time to say it, so I would have been better off not saying it. Now, to my benefit, because she's a clever woman, she said, when was the last time you journaled? And I hadn't journaled for two days. So I have to preach what I practice and practice what I preach. And so in the case of saying journaling is so important, Plato said thinking is the soul talking with itself and there's no greater way to think or talk with yourself than on paper. And so journaling is very, very important. So even if you want to have a great conversation with somebody, as I say, if I've got to give a speech and it's about a particular topic, I've been doing this for years now, so I don't necessarily sit around and do it. But if I had to address uh, an organisation and the CEO of the company said to me, I really want you to talk to these guys about this, 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 and this, then I would write them into a speech and I would read that speech and I would memorise it off by heart and I'd give it. Now, the most important conversations you need to have in your life with either your partner or your children, you should write them down or journal what you want to say, how you're going to say it, and choose that time and place. Um, so the the idea of what, sorry, I'll go back to the Marcus Aurelius quote, he wrote Meditations, and in there he writes, memento more, remember you are mortal. You could leave life right now. Let that influence what you think and do and say. Now, that is neuro-linguistic programming. What you think is neuro, what you do is programming, what you say is linguistic. So NLP has been around for, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years, and somebody probably chiseled it on the, the wall of a cave with gronk, gronk, grunt. Um, but we all know that how we think and stinking thinking becomes bad language, you know, the, generally, I say self-love is first love. You can't love anyone until you love yourself. Another reason why I believe um, the healthy, the mind and body, and the reason I work with people on a mind and body front is that when people start to feel better in their clothes and walk taller and walk upstairs without huffing and puffing or don't get tired all the time because they're just, you know, overweight or eating too much carbohydrates or, you know, they start to feel better about themselves. And as a result, they start to be better about themselves. When you feel like rubbish, you then just be rubbish. And that's the neurolinguistic programming you're not even noticing, is that you can work it in reverse. So doing your exercise before you've gone and spoken to anybody else, maybe you journaled, and then you speak to other people because you've exercised, you're in a, hey, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You know, people say to me, why are you always happy? And I say, because I know how the story ends. I don't know when it'll end, but I know how the story ends. If I keep doing what I'm doing every single day with my morning routine, 
practicing my enlightenment and my education and my exercise and my eating and my engagement and my encouragement, and slow bits of entertainment or limiting it to a, a, a one hour or not scrolling away on mindless TikTok, whatever it is, which just then makes you go, wow, what did I do? What a waste of my life because you're never going to get that time back again. The idea that you're embodying all of the principles that you've agreed upon in your plan. And that's it. Most of the unhappiest people in the world just don't have a, a, a plan. <laughs> uh, George, George Bernard, Bernard Shaw said, the single biggest problem in communication is thinking that it's actually happened. So even the idea that you have a plan around a conversation, you thinking you've had a conversation in your plan, you should be planning the response you're expecting, you're looking for, or you would like. So a defence lawyer, when he goes to present, to, to prepare his defence, he thinks, what's the prosecution going to say to get out of this or to, to get me on this? And the prosecution thinks, what's the defence going to say to get out of this? So he prepares his pros prosecution and vice versa so that they win the case. Now, it's not about winning. The other One of the other seven habits of highly effective people is think win-win. You being right, you know, winning the battle but losing the war is you not being, you being right but wrong. You know, I, I, I have said to people in my time, you're going to wake up one day very, very right but very, very lonely. You know, look, hey, hey, and there'll be no one to tell anymore that you were right. I joke when I go places with my partner and somebody says, and what's your name? And she'll tell them and they'll say, and what's your name? And I say, I told you so. And we have a bit of a laugh because quite often I'll go, I told you so. Now, I thought that's been funny for a while until I get, <laughs> you know, that you start with that told you so stuff, okay? You think it's funny, no one else does. Oh, okay. Now, I had to be told that. Had I thought how many times I could get away with this, I think two, three, you might be able to say something that you think is funny. If it becomes your currency, then maybe people have decided not to, they don't feel comfortable that they can speak up. Now, so the you in my communicate um, mnemonic is a united front. You need to be united in the conversation you're having. Um, I remember my daughters at the, the um, went to one of their school graduations. My daughters were, were one year behind each other. So they went to a high school, all girls high school. And this, um, the, the vice principal got up and she gave a really good talk. And as they introduced her, they said she'd been around for 35 years. She'd be the vice principal of this school for 35 years. And I have a habit, and I've been doing this, and it's served me very, very well. I've met a lot of experts in my life on Men's Fitness Magazine over the course of six years. I worked out that I'd interviewed over 600 people. And these are athletes and just, you know, people who've had the right approach to life. And I would always ask them a question in the field within which their expertise lay. And not once did any of those people say, listen, I would rather not talk about that. They go, well, this is my life's work. This is my purpose. And they would tell me. Back to this point, as the evening, uh, there was a break in the evening and everyone went outside and, and I went outside, a bit of fresh air because there was an auction going on. And I saw this, the, this veteran vice principal having a smoke in the corner. And I went over to her and I said, hello, um, yourself. I'm uh, Annabelle and Madeline Lee's father. Um, Annabelle's graduating and, you know, and she said, oh, that's great, and smoking away. And I said, can I ask you a question as a 35-year-old veteran working in an all-girls school because she'd been at the school for that long? I said, what's the single biggest piece of advice you could give to a father of teenage daughters? And she's taking a big Clint Eastwood drag of a cigarette and she said, never, ever shut the door. And I said, wow, that's, that's, that's brilliant because only recently they keep having the door shut and I was only thinking, she said, no, 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 you idiot. I mean, no matter what your daughters do, don't ever shut the door on them because what will happen? Don't shut them out. Don't say, right, that's it, get out. This wasn't the rules, regulations or principles of this family. She said, because what you'll do is you will deliver them into the drug dealers and the pimps and the most undesirable people and the most undesirable future as short as it will probably be, that you would ever have wanted for her. You spend all this money on this education, then she gets an earring on your nose or a tattoo or whatever it is, and you go and blah, 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 blah. Now, that, that to me was great advice. The only other great advice somebody gave me on, in relation to my daughters was that 
daddy's little girl, now this is for the men of daughters out there, daddy's little girl has always been daddy's little girl. And, you know, when I was uh, growing up, I'm, I'm one of 10 kids and <clears throat> I was a middle child. So, you know, my eldest, uh, the eldest was a girl, then there was four boys and then there was my sister Kathleen. And my father, understand, and then there was another three boys, and my father understanding her situation was just so lovely to Kathleen and he would always, you know, call her baby cats. And I was very, very jealous. We get on famously now, but I was very, very jealous of her as a younger man. And my father would say, he'd tell my sister Kathleen little birdie stories. He'd put on a whistling thing and he'd say, you know, and the little birdie, would, and he'd explain what the little birdie meant and what he said to the little birdie about how wonderful um, Kathleen was. And I would always say, what did the little birdie say about me, daddy? And he'd say, nothing. <laughs> and I would think, oh, you know, but what somebody had said to me, now my father, as baby cats became a teenager, he then withdrew, <laughs> when I say withdrew, the relationship changed because she developed into a woman. Um, and I believe, and, and an expert told me, their opinion is that what men do that they shouldn't do is they love their little girls and they're so smothering of their daughters in love and affection. And then their daughters start to develop into women, so they shut the show. They go, right, oh, that's it. And they're not going to give the daughters the hugs and the love and affection um, that they gave her as a child. Now, the little girl who's craved this dad's attention and her father, and she's daddy's little girl, she wonders what she's done wrong. And in some cases, they blame their own development or maturation on, or sexuality on the loss of their father's love, if it coincides and if they're clever enough or paranoid enough. Now, here's your problem. Not only do you ruin the father-daughter bond, but Fast Freddy's going to come in and you're going to have a 14-year-old pregnant daughter on your hands because he's going to show you the loving, her the loving that you took away. So in that, to that, which is what none of us want or ever wanted. So to that effect, um, you know, just don't ever shut the door, as the, 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 the principal Mary Ryland said, or vice principal, and don't shut yourself out on that loving relationship that you had. Sure, it's going to change. I mean, my daughters are 24 and 23. As little girls, I taught them how to hug. Freud says we're all born animals. It's up to society to condition us into people. And so we've all seen, whether you ever watch 60 Minutes, a little boy who was raised, you know, he grew up as a chicken and he'd sit in the chicken's coop thinking that he was a chicken because that's what he knows. Tarzan, I know the Lord Greystoke, it was a story, but he became, he was raised with, with, the, with the monkeys and the, or the chimpanzees and he could speak chimpanzee. We're very much, they talk nature or nurture and environment, etc. We become the environment that we're in. And I think when Freud said it's up to society to condition us into people, that's our role as a parent to condition our children into good young men and women. And so the idea of me saying to my daughters when they're little and they'd give me a hug and they and I go, no, they give me a squeeze hug, squeeze hug. That's how you, you hug. And they would give me a squeeze hug. Now, as time went on and they got into high school and they started studying biology and physics and all that, they'd come home and they'd tell me what they'd learned. And I would love it. And I would ask them, of course, as a conversation starter, what did you learn today that you could teach me that you reckon I wouldn't know? And they said, did you know what oxytocin was? And at the time, I actually didn't know. And they said, and even sometimes if I did know, I would say no, because here we had a conversation where I'd say, you tell me what you think you know, and I'll tell you what I think I know. And we'd have a debate around it. And on this occasion, I'll talk about oxytocin. Oxytocin is known as the love hormone. It's released after 20 <coughs> seconds of hugging. Now, oxytocin is also the hormone that is released in childbirth. Um, it soothes the mother. It lessens the pain. It strengthens the mother-child bond, which we as dads will never have that bond. You know, I think they deserve that. They've just gone through, nine, you know, 40 weeks of pregnancy and however many hours of labour. But that mother-daughter bond or mother-son bond in childbirth is heightened by the release of the hormone oxytocin. Now, when my daughters were telling me that, and they said it's also released after a 20-second hug. And so we developed as a family oxytocin. So when my daughters would do, you know, we go and we'd have dinner or something, and I'd say, can we have an oxytocin hug? And we'd all hug, and then we'd all go, oxytocin, might be daggy. These are the greatest memories of my life, and they will be. And when I say life's about meaning and memories, you create the meaning through the memories and the memories through the meaning, 
That to me had a lot of meaning to it and will always be a lovely memory. Now, ideally, if we look after our bodies again, we will have our memories through to the end. Our, body, our memories don't just come from the brain. It also is, is how we carry on physically and the food that we put into it. High sugar diets are going to create Alzheimer's and, and dementia and all those things in excess. So have a bit of balance. Excessive alcohol will kill brain cells and can lead to brain cancer or, or Alzheimer's, all those sort of things. I talk about being a preventative hypochondriac. Think of the worst thing that could possibly go wrong and do everything in your power to make sure it won't happen. I personally believe when I say that the life's about meaning and memories, if and you create the memories through the meaning and the meaning through the memories, if I lose my memory, that's the greatest crime I could have ever imposed upon myself. Excuse me now, if it happens, it happens. I won't remember. But um, I'd rather it not happen. And if I can prevent that, then what do I need to do? Things as simple as eight hours sleep a night. People don't get enough sleep. I'd love to talk to you blokes about sleep on another one of these occasions. Um, so the idea of um, of never, ever shutting the door, I'm, I'm careful of staying on track and staying on time here. Um, the idea of never, ever shutting the door, that's um, or never, ever saying no in a conversation, that to me is uh, part of communication. Uh, the I in my communicate uh, mnemonic is intelligence. And the idea of asking intuitive and intelligent questions is the fact that you have to think about what you're saying. Um, I talk about a time and a place for everything. If you're a father who gets up early, <clears throat> works hard all day, and then gets home and your partner wants to bring something up, it's in your best interest to communicate to your partner your love language. Now, my love language is I just love to have conversations early in the morning rather than late at night. The reason I said dumb things at 2 o'clock in the morning was I was just tired. And the idea of sleep deprivation being used as a punishment during the wars was all very clever of the, the, the warring people who were holding the hostages or the war criminals there, but they're trying to get the code out of the bloke. And I can't remember it. No, oh, gee, he kept his mouth closed, that bloke. I think if he knew the code, he would have told him. He couldn't remember the code because memory, again, is another one of those things that sleep deprivation robs us of. When we sleep, we restore our physical and our mental. The brain decides, the sleep within brain decides what's worth keeping, what's not worth keeping, because there's too much that comes along. So again, memories that have meaning to them are going to be stored more so. So ask those intelligent and in intuitive questions in the stage of communication, whether in the boardroom or whether in the in the uh, bedroom, for, if you like. But ask the questions. When I say intuiting, think of the defence and the prosecution. It's not about manipulation, but it is about staying on the right side of the fence that you're actually in control, not controlling the conversation, but in control of your part in the, in the conversation. The idea that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, the overarching theme of that book is that we want to fix things as men. We don't just want to listen. Quite often our partners just want to be heard, particularly if because they're now mothers, their single girlfriends have left them because they're, you know, and this happens. If, if you've plucked a girl from the group earlier than the others, then as the children come along, she's, they start, people just do, and they'll start to ghost her for the fact that the things you have in common are not as regular. Um, a friend is another just like you. When women can't communicate with each other, even dads, I, I noticed myself when I had daughters and I, my, my first daughter was born when I was 30, my mates who didn't have kids, they weren't really my mates very quickly, you know, because I couldn't be going out to the bars and the pubs and all that sort of thing. Um, so then the C in my uh, communicate uh, mnemonic is also just care, having care. It's one thing to ask intuitive and intelligent questions, but caring about the answer, caring enough about your partner and the relationship that you're in, again, even in the workplace, the colleagues that you, you know, block heads or butt heads with are the ones that you obviously have shown some contempt or disdain or lack of care to. Um, my Some of my struggles that I had in the workplace when I was in sales were always with the accounts department. They would see my big uh, expense accounts and they'd see my pay packs and my commissions. And it wasn't until one of them drunkenly one night headbutted me at a function that was celebrating another great big sales win and I'd got the Salesman of the Year Award and this bloke headbutted me. <laughs> and and uh, being a boxer, I was, I was taught to fight and we box. Headbutting is just one of the worst... There's one thing worse than headbutting, 
that's being spat at. And I was, I was spat at at another occasion and then had head butted on the same thing. That was when I finally said, right, this is gloves are off sort of thing. But on this occasion, when the bloke head butted me and I thought, wow. And I, luckily I wasn't drunk, not that I would have anyway, but I, I grabbed his hands and I sat him down and I said, what upset you that much that you would headbutt me? And he said, I hate you. And I said, why do you hate me? And he says, because you don't care about me. I said, how do you know I don't care about you? And he said, what's my name? And I told him his name. And, I, and he said, you just don't give an F about me. And I, it turns out he thought nobody did. But I told him, I, this and this, you play golf at here and you're doing this in Kempsey and you're doing that. And, uh, and, and whether it was the course of sobering up or not, he was like, oh, oh, oh. And then I, you always get to the what's really, you know, it's never the tail on the bed, what's really the problem. And I said, why do you think that I don't care about you then? And he goes, you know what really pisses me off? And I said, what? And he said, we do more work than anybody. We do this and we do that. And you're the one with the big commission checks and I put your super in and look, we're celebrating you and we're not celebrating me. And I said, do you know what I thought by inviting you? Because every other company I've worked for, the sales teams had just gone out and got on the lash and had a great night. I thought by actually inviting you and including you that I, you'd feel good about that. And he said, no, you're just rubbing it in my face. I said, okay, now I understand. Now, what I ended up doing was I said the next day, it wasn't the next day actually because that was a Friday, on the Monday I came in and I had a conversation with him. He didn't remember most of it. And I said, what I'd really love you to do, I'd love you to come along on a lunch with a client. And he goes, oh, yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. I said, just, you know, be careful on the tonk. Don't drink too much. And the idea is you always stay one drink behind the clients. Now, as the lunch went on and we did what we did and all that sort of thing and we came back to the office, that was that. Now, on the Friday night, we had drinks again and he was very lovely to me and I thought it was because we'd understood each other. But what had happened was I'd shown him enough care that I cared about him enough to involve him. But I also, they say, you know, when I said seek first, understand, then to be understood, he was enjoying what was happening there. But the clients at the lunch brought up a couple of things that had gone on and what we'd overcome and what we'd had to do. And he said, I would never want to do your job. Now I know why they pay you guys the big bucks. And I thought, thank you. So we understood each other. So he cared. He showed, I showed him that I cared, which eventually got his care. Now, in a relationship perspective, you know, taking your wife out to fancy places and all that sort of thing, it might be up to a stage, then it just becomes expected and it becomes commonplace. So I think finding, you know, I, used, I love going to nice restaurants, but I love it. Do the people I'm taking like doing it. My daughters these days, my daughter the other day said, yeah, dad, I just, <clears throat> I just like to go to a Sam movie. So we did. And then she said, shall we grab a bite somewhere? And I said, yeah. And she said, I wonder if we could get into it. It was a nice restaurant, Saki. And I said, let's try. We'll get a lovely restaurant. It was a win-win. I personally, not a big fan of movies. I used to also think the blokes who took girls to movies, for me, that was three hours I couldn't have talked to the girl for. So I like to talk. But also it seemed that all we were talking about was the movie. So it's an easy conversation starter, but I didn't get to ask the girl any of the questions I'd like to because we're talking about the movie. <laughs> and again, it's that curiosity that you really, really need in the conversation, which is the asking of the intuitive and the imaginative questions. Now, my communicate, the eight is just the eight E's. So in the communications, where have I been enlightened in that situation? Where have I educated that person or myself, where have I done some exercise with that person? You know, I, I bought punch through lunch into our company once so that we were all involved as a team. And Aristotle said, you'll find out more about a person in an hour of play than you will in a year of conversation. So if you want to, you know, touch footy teams, probably not as much, um, but it is the banter that happens around play that you find out who people really are. You see their competitive streak. I, there was a fellow who did work in our accounts department at one organisation I worked with that in a touch footy team that we did have, excuse me, he was so competitive. And then he had a function, he, he was talking some way and I said, would you like to get up and present what you're talking about to the company so that we'll understand? He was in marketing actually. And he did. And he got up and he presented his idea. He presented it so intelligently and with such poise that I then asked him, would you consider getting into sales? And he became our sales director of the company. He's, he's you know, running a sales company now. But he had all the skills and abilities. And cleverly enough, he put himself in the right place at the right time to be seen. 
So the idea of engagement, uh, the exercise side of things, and then again, engaging with people, that is communication, but engaging can also, there's a, uh, a, saw, a sign I saw once on the wall of a palliative care unit that said, sometimes your quiet presence is, means more than all the words in the world. And so the idea of non-verbal communication, just being present with somebody in a wherever, you know, like, would you like to come to the shops with me? If your partner says, do you want to come to the shops with me? Say, yeah, and go to the shops with her. You know, um, if the kids especially say, hey, Dad, do you want to do this? Now, um, I, I, I get to, to spend a lot of time hearing my clients' problems and also my friends' problems. And one of my friends had said recently had complained, the, the, the wife rather, was complaining about the fact that the, the sons wouldn't go for a coffee with this with the dad. He goes, hey, boys, do you want to come for a beer with me? No, no, no. And yet the daughter said, dad, would you come for a coffee with me? And he said, oh, no, I've got to do this, that and the other. And it's just as important for him to go for a coffee with the daughter than just beers with the boys. And that's what happens if you've got boys and girls. But, you know, they say that you don't choose the favourite, the favourite chooses you. I'm my mother's favourite and my father's favourite, so my siblings would tell you. But I actually did choose to be that because I spent more time with my parents than anybody else did. Again, under the idea that memento more, to me, I, it's a very difficult thing to adopt at first, but if you hug your children like you're never going to see them again, you converse with your parents like you're never going to have that conversation again, and anyone who's lost parents will know how they go, can't have that conversation with dad anymore, can't have that conversation with mum anymore. Even it could be 20 years since they passed away and you still feel that, you know, um, and that's why the idea of stoicism or the idea that you could leave life right now, when I'm having conversations with people, then that to me is this could be the last time we have a conversation. So I'm very invested in that conversation. And it just turns out that little by little, a little becomes a lot. And the more and more you show curiosity and you are present and you do treat it like it'll be the last time you'll ever see that person, then those memories do stack up and the quality of that relationship does escalate and magnetize or, or magnify rather, and you have a much more uh, time-based and quality time-based relationship. And again, um, idle words or idle chit-chat or small talk, those sort of things don't interest me. I have no time for idle chit-chat or small talk. The, the idea that never get into the get, never get into an argument with a fool because they'll bring you down to their level and beat you on experience. And, the you know, I don't suffer fools. Now, by that I mean a fool to me is not an unintelligent person. A fool to me is somebody who, you know, the idea of insanity doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. A fool to me is somebody who will not learn. A fool to me is somebody who is closed-minded, um, who, you know, just thinks they know it all when they don't. I might have told you blokes. My, I asked my dad when I was eight years of age, when do you die? And he said, when I was eight, you die the day you stop learning. Now, when I was about 45, I said, dad, when do you think the end of the world will be? And again, this was a red wine conversation. He said, well, the world ends the day you die. And I thought, well, that is pretty true. It's pretty profound. It doesn't mean, you know, throw your litter in the ocean and forget about greenhouse gas emissions. But it really does mean that life and your involvement in life and what you contribute to life has a lot more meaning and a lot more responsibility that you have for those people in your life. One of my clients is in her 80s. And she said to me one day, not, not long ago, estranged relationships with her daughter and in-laws and things like that. And she said to me, I sometimes wonder, would anybody miss me? if I were to die. And I said, oh, I'd, me, I'd miss you, yourself. And she said, um, well, I know you would. Um, but she said, no, I just wonder, would anyone really miss me? And I said, would you miss you? And she said, well, I guess I'd miss my dogs and I'd miss my garden. And she feeds the birds while I'm there. And she said, I miss the birds. And I said, well, that's the most important thing because wherever you go, there you are. And so if you're not happy with who you are as a person, then start communicating better with who you are. You know, when I say start the morning with a 
with a morning routine. One of the things, you know, I, I, I offer to anyone who wants to, a morning routine template, david at leeway.com.au, and I'll send it to you. And there are things that I actually don't include in that because the list is vast and there are things that I don't even think about. But one of them, which only takes a minute, <laughs> excuse me, is I, I, I smile at myself in the mirror for one minute. It takes 14 seconds for a negative thought to take place and to take hold of you. But it takes 67 seconds for a positive thought to undo, undo and replace the negative thought and to make it a positive emotion. So given that I haven't gone to the mirror with any negative uh, emotions, I just prime myself with that one minute of smiling. And I'm generally laughing, but I haven't stopped doing it because it's almost superstitious. So the idea that um, I had a lot of other things that I wanted to talk to you blokes about, um, which I won't get around to because it's uh, I've got about eight minutes left, which I will. But what I do have is I've recorded um, my book, as I say, is with the publisher, and I've recorded a chapter. I've recorded the book an audio version. Now, um, the people are either readers or they're listeners. And I know that uh, there's, you know, Mark Twain said, a man who does not read has no advantage over the man who cannot read. Now, it may be that you just do not have time to read. So even if you can read, but you cannot find the time or make your the time, Naval Ravikant said, read anything you like. So it could be the form guide. Read it until you actually form the habit of reading. But if all else fails, get onto Audible and audio books. One of the things I wanted to offer you guys is that I have recorded a chapter on communication. It's chapter 21 of my book. I will either send the written chapter or the audio version of that chapter to anybody who wants it. It's david at leeway.com.au. Send me the email. Um, if Even if you want to put in the email where you're having troubles with communicating. Um, Zach and I were talking at the beginning of this and he was saying, you know, it was an idea of maybe we could have a Q&A one night, which I would absolutely love. Uh, one of my favourite podcasters is Tim Ferriss. Now, Tim Ferriss has the Tim Ferriss Show. It's one of the most downloaded. It is the most downloaded podcast in the world. I know blokes will say to me, I listened to Joe Rogan the other day and, you know, I like Joe Rogan. I'm not, he's not my I don't listen to his podcast because I don't have time. I listen to Robert Greene's and Tim Ferriss's. And Tim Ferriss, the reason I listen to his is he interviews the top CEOs of the top 500 companies, all of the most famous um, athletes on the planet, Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of my, my heroes, and he asks them questions about their morning routines and things like that. And out of that, you kind of go, I'll try that. Doesn't work for me. Try that. Did work for me. I'll try it, but I'll try it for 14 days. Even though they say habit takes 21 days to stick, 14 days for me is whether I know I'm going to bother with it or have the time with it or not. Um, having said that, one of the things that had come out of that was Peter Drucker, who wrote uh, was a management consultant and worked with executives, worked out that some people are readers and some people are listeners. They're either one or the other. I'm both. I just love it. And if I can't finish a book, then I'll listen to it on Audible or whatever. Now, the point of that is if you're a reader, just say, hey, love to read the chapter. If you're a listener, just say, hey, I'd love to listen to the chapter. But within there, if you can say, oh, no, the reason I brought up Tim Ferriss is Tim Ferriss does his Q&A. But what he would do that I wouldn't be able to do, which I'd love to do as well, is he does it with tequila. <laughs> so he'll sit there and either drink red wine or drink tequila, and he just drunk, drunk dialing, he calls it, and people send in the questions via email. Now, given he's got 400 million downloads and however many hundreds of thousands of followers, he might go, right, oh, Ben Greenish has actually asked, um, you know, what do you eat for breakfast on a Sunday morning? And he'll have a swig of his thing and he'll say, well, Sundays I eat bison or whatever he says. I'd love to do that one day and obviously I wouldn't do it with the, with the red wine and the tequila as much as I'd love it. Um, but, yeah, keen to do that. But the, the what I would have got around to speaking about tonight, there's a couple of quotes um, that I wanted to talk about, but I'll bring them up next time. But again, around trust, and I'll quickly run you through it. So actually, I'll do two things to leave you hanging, so to speak. Convert is my presentation skills uh, mnemonic. So if you're going into a boardroom and you have to do a presentation, think of the C is what is the curtain raiser? What is the curtain raiser that's going to be on the screen behind you and or that you're going to have yourself introduced as um, uh, 
my curtain raiser, I'm always still awkward because I'm talking about myself and I'm not, you know, I can tell stories, but to say, well, I'm this and I'm that and I've done this and I've done that and I've worked with a thousand, this is great, but I'm always awkward around selling myself. When people ask me what I do for a living, I say, I, in, in a nutshell, I help people get out of their way. I help people get out of their own way. And I do that by asking them questions and you answer the questions yourself because you know what they are. And if you don't know, I get them out of you. But from a presentation perspective, the C is the curtain raiser. The O is the overview. So you tell them what you're going to tell them. The N is their needs. You address their needs. The V is you verify what those needs are. And it's what problem do I solve? Uh, the E is the, an emotional check. So you check in there and you evaluate the room is understood. So in a nutshell, you say at the beginning, you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you've told them. That's essentially what I was taught. But on the emotional check, I tell them what I've told them, and then I ask them, have I got that? And then the R is reminding them. So I'll go, right, I spoke about this. Now, tonight I did. I talked to you about my communicate mnemonic, and I can send you what that is if you didn't write it down. I can send you the convert mnemonic if you didn't write it down. The big one in after reminding the T in convert is trust. And then the idea of trust is you cannot gain trust without the, the, the trust mnemonic is truth, reliability, understanding, strength of character, and time. It does take time. Nobody it takes six seconds to make a first impression. Um, but we live in a very untrusting world. And we live in a very untrusting world because there's so many scammers and hackers. And as smart as I think I may be, I got scammed into buying a pair of RM Williams boots, which I've even worked with RM Williams. I know they're never going to go on sale. I bought a pair and they're not even made in China. I know the guy who used to work with them, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I got scammed because I didn't think Facebook would have had an ad on there that was not legit. Anyway, I got scammed. So <laughs> very untrusting. Um, only the paranoid survive. So it takes a very long time to build trust and trust is only built through that truthfulness, reliability, understanding of each other, being on the same page, being strong. You know, trust doesn't come from a place of weakness. Uh, Brene Brown says you need to be courageous to be vulnerable and you need to be vulnerable to be courageous. Um, so with that, gentlemen, david at leeway.com.au, any of those things, if you'd like to address them. And I'm happy, you know, some of you blokes have sent me emails and you've told me the, the whole story. And I've, I've loved reading them and I've been very, very honoured that I've been trusted with that confidentiality and even with your feelings and your story. And that's my job. My job is, uh, if you like, as a coach, I think group coaching is brilliant. And but you've got to, if you get yourself a coach within the HPF, seek the men out. Seek me out if you like, but seek the men out within the cohort because they're your personal trainers. HPF's the gym. And if you don't do your exercises, then you didn't take advantage of your gym membership. I worked for Anytime Fitness for two years um, in a media capacity and a, in an influence with all the personal trainers. The reason why the gym industry works the way the gym industry works, the average gym in Australia has, the average fitness first, <coughs> excuse me, has five and a half thousand members. The average plus fitness has a thousand members. The Anytime, average Anytime Fitness has 1,500 members. Anyone who goes to any of those gyms, particularly at four o'clock or 5.30 in the morning, will see that there's no one in there. The car parks are empty. Um, to apply for a DA, you have to have at least nine car parks to own a gym. Now, the reason the gym, the, the gym industry works is because the average member, gym member goes to the gym 1.1 times per week. That's why they work. Now, I go to a plus fitness and I take two towels and I put one on the leg thing and I put one on the bench thing and I tick-tack until I'm out of there because you could be just, I do upper body, lower body, and I'll be just as guaranteed when I get across to the lower body, somebody's on it. So it's broken up my routine. But the towel system seems to work. My brother lives in Wagga and he goes to the Anytime Fitness area and carries seven different colored towels with him. Bit of a funny joke that we have. So gentlemen, very happy to engage on any level, but do uh, connect with your coaches within the cohort. They'll be your personal trainers. And the biggest thing that I think is a level of accountability and you've reached out and you're, and you're part of this group for that accountability. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll land you with, if any of you know with, about Pavlov, Pavlov's dogs, Pavlov was a Austrian psychiatrist as well, and he would ring bells and the dogs would come and he would feed them. And he would ring the bell and the dogs would come and he would feed them. And 
then ring the bells and the dogs would come and he didn't feed them, but they would still salivate at the sound of the bells. And so when I talk about having your goals and mine are over here, I have them and they're all, well, they're somewhere. I shall went to the beach today, so they'll be in my backpack. But here's my journal, my journal as well. And the idea of Pavlov and writing your goals down, people say they've got them in their phones, you know, all that sort of business. Um, the purpose template that I would have sent out to anyone who asked me, fill it in, print it out and fill it in. Don't put it on your laptop because for Pavlov, in order for you to get excited about picking that up, the P is it has to be portable. The A is that it has to be actionable. With everything you write in your purpose and dream goal setting templates that I would have sent you, it's got to be actionable. It's not a wish. It's not an intention. It's not a, it's something you intend to do. Um, Benjamin Franklin said, resolve to perform what you ought and perform without fail what you resolve. What you resolve is a resolution. 32 days in it takes, everyone stops on their resolutions. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. Start them again. Start them again. But with your goals written out in a portable, actionable, visible, so you've got to be able to see them, learnable. You have to have a system within there and within the template where you can learn from it. You know, you know what? Out of 10, where seven is not an option, what do I give myself for mental, physical, spiritual, social, financial, family, business, and romance? Well, actually, now I can give myself an eight. I was a four. That's learning. You're learning as you go along. The O is just for optimism. And the other V is for ver verified. You have to have verification that you're going. What is the visible? Visible is the first V, but the verification that you get. Can I see that I'm progressing? Have I learned? Have I used my optimism? Is it paying off? Yes, yes, yes. So, gentlemen, 